YWCA of Clark County. Hi there, this is Lori. And this is Kay. Thank you so much for sharing some time with us today. Um, let's see here, we are going to advance the screen. Oops. All right, Donna, I thought I had this. I'm trying. There we go. Um, so just a very brief intro. Um, Kay and I have both been with the YWCA for, for quite a few years. I would say my first training in groups was when I started uh, about 15 years ago, and it was merely shadowing a seasoned group um, facilitator. And I'll be honest, I did not feel very prepared for it. Years later, Wixapp offered a great two-day training, the Circle of Hope, and Kay and I both got to attend that. And it dramatically changed my confidence and skills. So this is both based on Wixapp's great support and instruction and also the years of support groups that we've done since then and learning things that work well and some things that were a total bust that we figured out sometimes by trial and error. So we're happy to share this with you here. I, again, I really want to give a thanks to Wixapp for supporting this and making this available and also to each of you for attending and for the work that you do with survivors. Oops. Sorry, this could take me half a second with the... Uh, there so good morning. We have um, a couple of objectives today, pretty straightforward. Gain skills to recognize and deal with the potential red flags. And we're talking about during the interview process, during the group sessions, um, and at the end. And then take away ideas to improve group retention. And we spend a little extra time on this one because it is a pretty common challenge and one that we feel like we've gained some skill at dealing with pretty well. So um, that's a place where I, I think we have some strengths and um, things that, that might be more um, hands-on that we can share with you. And um, in this webinar, we're, the type of group we are addressing, first of all, we both work for a sexual assault program, so all of our experience is in sexual assault groups. Additionally, all the groups that we do here at the YWCA are closed. So in sexual assault here, we don't do ongoing groups. So we're assuming that you um, are doing an intake process, that the groups are eight to 10, well, six to 10 weeks long um, and that it's the same group of participants each time with each group session. And then also the groups we do are psychoeducational. Um, and the, oops, sorry, I'm not working there anymore. <laughs> so with psychoeducational groups, the primary focus is to provide support information and education. And when I'm talking to people about this, I usually describe it as a tool-based group. And the example I like to use is if someone says I'm having flashbacks, the, the purpose of the group isn't why am I having them, what's the meaning of them. The purpose of the group is what can I do about them. And so that kind of helps straighten that a little bit. We also um, refer to the Circle of Hope book that Wixap can, can provide. They have hard copies, and I believe you can download it. And you can go there to get more information on the difference between psychoeducational and therapy groups if that's something that you'd like to know more about. And even though we are um, strictly a sexual assault program, we work closely with the, the domestic violence program here, and I recognize that a lot of programs are dual programs. So there are certainly some differences between the groups, and we'll um, try to um, acknowledge that and recognize that not all the things that are appropriate for a sexual assault group are um, equally as appropriate for a domestic violence group. So the key part, starting out with the goals and foundations of effective group facilitation. So there's some things that as facilitators you really want to make sure you're establishing, creating, maintaining. Um, and we took these, these are from Linda Ferris Kurtz, uh, her book on self-help and support groups. I think above all, my role as a facilitator is to create a safe space. So the, the things listed here, so information exchange. Now part of that I think is definitely from facilitators. We, we have a lot of 
handouts and information and grounding exercises, but even more importantly is the opportunity for support group members and participants to share some of the, the strategies that they've also discovered. They've got some incredible coping skills to have made it this far. So group is a great chance to highlight that for them, recognizing that their strengths um, really are valuable and to get an opportunity to share that. Sometimes they feel like, oh man, I'm barely making it. And group is a chance for them to recognize that they've really done some great, great things and to even to share those. And when, when a group participant shares something and another says, oh, I never thought about that. That's a great idea. That is way more powerful and impactful than if it's coming from the facilitator. The mutual support piece, facilitators model an empathetic way to be in the world, a supportive response, and it helps the group members both see that and practice that. A lot of times, I've had so many times when a, a group member has said, well, I've never trusted women before, or I've never, um, you know, they've just never had friendships or relationships, and not that necessarily will leave with a friendship, but they, um, they may or may not, but they also might leave with the experience of having been respectfully, safely uh, given the space to be vulnerable with another human being. The coping and self-efficacy, you can, with this you can point out the coping skills in such a non-judgmental manner. Sometimes people might say um, really disparaging comments like, oh, well, I, I isolate and um, I just can't even get out and socialize with people. And I consider myself the queen of reframing at times. And I can honestly and, and authentically say I really want to recognize that, that that's a good skill to have because it can be protecting you. So instead of you know, seeing that as a negative, I mean the fact that they even made it to group is a huge opportunity to step out and to um, and that they're you know, doing what they can when they have the emotional resources to do it. Social isolation, that's, that's obvious, and this is huge. Sometimes just walking into the room and seeing other people suddenly changes it from, I thought I was the only one that this happened to, to, well, she looks normal, and she looks normal, and she looks normal. I can't believe this has happened to them as well. So it can really help with the reducing isolation. The stress reduction, I will point out that I think coming to group can be very stressful for people, just recognizing that. This is not easy work. And hopefully though as facilitators you can decrease that, um, and we'll talk about ways to decrease that, part of it is by being predictable, bringing lots of tools for them to share, reflecting back. So ultimately it is reducing stress stress, but recognizing that may not, um, just by signing up or coming to group, that is generally not an instant reduction of stress. And then lastly, safety. And this is super important. How you do this with the intake, um, you create safety by setting clear expectations, by answering questions for them, by doing the guidelines at the start, and just a constant awareness even of the space. An example for ours is, we have a, a room that goes to a, or a door that goes to a closet kind of off to the side of the room. And it, it, now we have it in part of our curriculum just to explain in the first week what's behind that door because realizing that's a real, you know, the members wondered is someone else going to be coming or going from there. And so taking into account what the, what the room space looks like and feels like and how to make it as safe and welcoming as possible. So we're going to talk a lot today about red flags and I want to be really clear because I think red flags can often have a negative connotation. For the sake of this webinar, I'm using it as an indicator of something to pay attention to. It's really honoring your gut instinct based on your past experiences and training as group facilitators. And if it's helpful to think of it as it's not about screening people out, but it's screening people into group. If you have any of the red flags, listen to them. Talk with a, 
your co-facilitator, your supervisor, or a colleague, and really figure out a plan of action to um, compassionately respond to it and address it because, again, you're in the role of, of keeping this safe space and, and being proactive in doing that. So um, for the intake part, the ones that we're going to be talking about specifically are recent suicide attempts, if someone had a recent sexual assault, and participants who during the screening clearly need to share a lot. They may kind of take up a lot of um, time talking. So those are the ones we'll be um, talking about specifically. And if there are others that you think of that you want to add on to that, feel free to put them in the chat box and I'll do my best to monitor that while we're going back and forth on this, okay? So I think dealing with someone who's had a very recent suicide attempt can be unsettling and even a little scary sometimes. But um, again, when we're looking at screening people into group, we're also, um, if group isn't the best fit, we may be looking at screening them into other types of um, support. So the first thing is, um, I think with all of this is to be really transparent and honest. And people who have had a recent suicide attempt, um, that can be very triggering for the participant and for other members. It's, they're often very raw. And to come into group with that weight at that time can be really difficult. And the one-on-one -on -one framework may not be appropriate. I mean, a one-on-one -on -one framework would maybe more appropriate. So it might be talking to them about doing some one-on-one -on -one advocacy, weekly calls, or um, getting them into therapy if you have it at your agency or somewhere else. Um, and also, you know, maybe even before you go there, assess what support they already have. This person may have a lot of support already. They may be in therapy. They may be going to a, another type of group. Um, it doesn't hurt to make sure they have a suicide hotline number. It seems like they would, but I wouldn't assume that. So really discussing what other kinds of support and then how your agency can fit into that, whether or not it's going to be group. And then always discuss future participation in groups. So if it's not going to work right now, talk about the possibility of group being a good fit further down the road. I don't ever want to screen anybody permanently out of group with maybe very, very few exceptions to that. Um, so I think it's really important to not close that door, but to say there might be a better fit right now, but that doesn't mean we wouldn't come back and, and look at group again when it might be more in your best interest or a better fit for you. One thing that's really helpful is um, if you have policies about this. So maybe you have a policy that um, it can't, a suicide attempt can't be within a certain time frame, within the last three, six months, within the year, whatever that would be. And then other programming, because we have monthly uh, workshops for survivors that, where they could still have a group experience, but it's more of a hands-on healing, one-time experience, much less triggering, um, much less demanding as far as emotional, emotional types of things. Um, do you have a healing day for people? Do you have community events that they could participate in? Because one thing that if you're not screening them into group, it's really great if you can connect them with other survivors in other ways that might be less triggering, less demanding, and still provide some of that support and connection. And I um, appreciate someone has a, <clears throat> excuse me, has a comment that says we don't have an intake process um, and would really appreciate hearing about red flags that might, um, they might notice during the check-in process at the beginning of group, which I, I'm, I'm sure that's not uncommon at all. <clears throat> Sorry. So I think uh, we'll talk about the guidelines and I think that is going to be one of the, the best and strongest um, sort of supports you'll have for referring back. Um, I think sometimes, and, and absolutely, the, the Circle of Hope book is stunning and a great reference guide. And what also might help in that is having another, you know, making sure you've got another co-facilitator. 
without the screening process or the intake, that is a, a risk because people can show up at you know sort of all different um, spaces in their healing journey. And so I think that's a good thing to have a you know talk about that and have a plan of how you want to work through that stuff with your co-facilitator. And you may find kind of after doing the groups that wow, it really is worth it to do at least a brief intake. One thing that we, well here, I'll move forward on this. Sorry. So another red flag is if someone has been uh, just recently sexually assaulted. And you're probably noticing a, a pattern here in how we're approaching this. Um, but the concerns are if someone is dealing with a recent sexual assault, group discussions can actually trigger some pretty raw feelings about this. And you know, oftentimes the, the survivor who's just coming in after the group, um, this isn't an ideal space for them because they're often dealing with their kind of immediate safety needs, um, they're in crisis mode, and sometimes it's just getting through the day. So to, to come into a group with folks who have been dealing with this for a long time and um, can be just really be triggering and often feel like that they're not coping as well even though they're, they're actually doing a great job considering that it's just happened. So the other piece to that, the other concern is that the curriculum is not as useful. So the, you know, our curriculum focuses on long-term healing, assuming that you know, healing has been occurring along the way. We look at issues like relationship and trust and things that might still be pretty far out to look at for a recent survivor. Our general policy is that um, if it's happened within the last year, we don't recommend starting groups. Now that being said, there are certainly exceptions that we'll make. Um, you know, we've done some if it's been six months, and but really being thoughtful about that because to put someone in a group before it's appropriate is is not serving them well, and it's not serving the group well. So. Suggestions of how to address this, again, really being honest and especially validating their experience. And I am so grateful that they were willing to share that with me. And I, I really hear that they're wanting to seek services. And I will um, specifically say, and my role is to make sure I, I am responsible in getting you in the best services that we have available. As I'm explaining why it, it won't be appropriate for them to be in group. I very clearly say this is not because of you. This is our practice with the program because if, if I put someone in a group um, early on, it ends up being less supportive for them and, and I want to be responsible for them as someone who has been courageous enough to, to trust us by calling us or coming into our office that I really want to be sure I get them with the the best, most supportive services for them. <clears throat> so obviously looking at other support that would be appropriate right now. Again, I'm going to go through with advocacy and counseling. Um, they, might be, they might be hooked into other services too. So really giving the space and the time for that. It's not about saying, no, you don't qualify for this service. It's about saying, let's get you with the best one and talk about what would most meet your needs. And I will tell you, there are, um, it's happened um, m more than once, <laughs> a lot of times, where perhaps someone's friend or um, might be counselor or someone said, oh, you really need to get into group. And so they're doing what they have been told and trying to go along with what they think they're supposed to do because they may not be trusting their instincts. And when I've, I've explained why um, I wouldn't recommend them for group right now. There's actually been just this sigh of relief because I felt like I, they shared, it felt like it was too much on their plate right now, but they were thinking they should do that. So it can really be a gift for them to take care of the immediate needs that they probably want to and should be taking care of now. And also discussing that future participation in group is absolutely an option. That it doesn't mean they can never do that. We just want to be sure that that they have the, the best support right now. So 
again, thinking about policies that you have and really being able to explain those compassionately and genuinely and trusting that it is a, a you know, you're doing this for all the survivors um, and it's not about that one person in particular. And again, other programming. One thing that is um, really critical is if you are with a program that has hospital responders responding um, either on a crisis line or the, to the hospital, is make sure the responders know the, know the policy so that they don't, you know, in offering services, say, at the hospital, they don't say, oh, there's a group that's starting up. Because then if the survivor calls and wants to get into the group and we go through and explain why that wouldn't be appropriate, that, that feels really unfair that they were given false expectations on that. So make sure that the, the advocates are well trained on how to um, share that information or, or knowing when it's appropriate to refer someone. Uh, else on that? Okay. So let me circle back to a couple of quick questions. Um, one of the things I keep referring to Circle of Hope, and that's a support group guide um, that WICSAP created a few years ago. And I believe it's available on the website. If not, um, at wixap.org, that would be where you get that information. And then um, we're not using it. When I refer to a curriculum, uh, we, are, we don't use a specific curriculum that you can buy. It's one we've just created over the years. And I also wanted to say, as far as when we're talking about intakes or any of the things that you're going to see, um, you'll have our emails at the end. And feel free to email us. Probably email me because Lori's going to be on vacation for a month. Um, and we'll be happy to share intakes with you of samples or anything we talk about you'd like us to share with you. We're happy to do that. There was also um, a great uh, question or comment about clients who make comments that are victim blaming. And so maybe not necessarily during the screening, but it could be during the group and that that might hurt other people if it came up in group. And I would say during the, you know, if that comes up in the group, I would, and just as a facilitator, I would say, I can appreciate that might feel um, true for you. I, um, I would just say, you know, I would totally respectfully agree to disagree on that because I think there are, so if it's a victim blaming thing, um, that I firmly believe that no one ever deserves this or asks for it. To my core, I believe that. I think sometimes when people make a comment like that, it is often holding their own um, self-blame. And so I, I don't want to ignore that because if I don't say anything, then I might be seen as agreeing with that. So I can, again, really respectfully, um, I might say, I think a lot of people believe that, but you just need to know for all those who are here that I, I believe no one ever deserves it, no one ever asks for it. And so they will, they will hear me say that throughout the group time. That was a great comment. Thank you so much for that. So the next red flag, um, which pops up quite a lot actually, is a participant clearly needs significant space to talk or process her feelings. And this will often, often come out in the intake. And that can be really helpful because even if you screen this person in, and, and uh, honestly, usually I probably would screen them in after a conversation, but it gives you an idea about how, um, they, might be able, how they might communicate during group. So um, the, the concerns about that is that they may not be in a place where they're able to respond to redirection or listen to others. So um, it could be that they have held stuff in for a long time and the intake has actually provided the first chance they've ever had to talk to somebody. You may be hearing things that they've never told anyone. Um, that's not uncommon for someone in their 50s to come because they were assaulted as a kid and have never been able to share that. So they may just have a lot, a lot to share. And providing that space for them during intake is really helpful and useful and important. Um, however, that may not satisfy that need for them. They may still, you know, if they've held that in for 50 years, they may need to share that a lot and a lot more. And so being honest with them, validate their need to share and process how important that is. 
the honor that you feel in receiving that information, um, listen to them. Spend as much time with them as you can. And if you're going to run out of time, make another appointment. You know, you want to be there for that person. But explain the group process, the time limitations, and that if you have a two-hour group and ten people, even if everybody talked the whole time, that would you know, be a limited number of minutes for each person, and that that may or may not meet their needs right now. So you also want to assess and offer support. This person may not have any other support around the sexual assault. And so talking about maybe individual advocacy, talking about therapy, and maybe she's been in therapy, but has therapy met the need to talk about the sexual assault? Because sometimes therapists will shy away from that, and so the person will say, yeah, I've had counseling, but we don't talk about that. So maybe making sure that they have somewhere to talk about the sexual assault. And then if you're going to screen them out, be sure to discuss future participation in group. That right now this is really raw, and one-on-one -on -one seems like really important to, for her to have her needs met, to really be able to give this process the attention it deserves. Um, so if she can't be screened in, definitely let her know that group is a real possibility and might be really helpful down the line. Um, if you are going to screen her in, it's really important to talk about your role in redirection and time monitoring during the intake, but then talk about it again during the first few groups so that, she, so that all participants realize that you're not talking about one person that's just part of your role and that's part of the way group works to keep things balanced and moving forward so that someone doesn't feel singled out. It also might remind um, participants who you've had that talk with before, and you can have it with all of them actually, um, that yeah, she, she told me that before. This is something that they do in group. This is a normal group process. Um, and then again, other programming. Um, whether or not they're going to come to group, if this person has not much support on the outside, other programming in addition to group could be helpful too. So if you screen them in, maybe coming to other events that might be like um, a day, like say you're doing a day when you're doing collaging, where there can be more space for sharing or more space for talking. That might be helpful to take some of the weight off of that in group. Um, or if it's just other programming, say we really want to have you connected. I, you know, we really value your experience and want to support you and find other ways but to help this person connect and feel supported until group would be a good fit. I'm going to go back just one here. I appreciate um, someone had shared of not understanding why if someone's been assaulted in the past year would they be turned away. The, is there anything wrong with raw emotions in the group? And thank you so much for asking that or clarifying it. No, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. In fact, they do end up, you know, that we want to have a safe space for the emotion. But going back to the, um, so thank you for asking about that. It's not just that, um, that emotions would come up, but that we really want them to be in, in a spot that serves their needs. My experience has been when, um, you know, as we're doing the intake and we're asking folks to commit for those eight weeks or six weeks or ten, however long the, the group is, that that can be one extra burden to someone who's just trying to, um, to get through day to day. And then there can be a lot of guilt on top of that if they don't make it, can't come. So it feels like one more thing that they have um, not done well. And what I really want to do is um, set them up for success. We certainly don't require that people finish it. And we talk about that during the intake. But um, I will say the times when I have gone against my gut on that and said, oh no, I really want them to, to be in group, um, I, I have regretted that. And so I really, it's not about that they can't be in group. And I'm, we just use the year guideline because that's a safe one. Absolutely we've put people in earlier than that. But it's also with a, it's, it's with a, you know, a thoughtful conversation with them about what are their other supports. Are they in counseling? Are they, um, you know, do they feel well supported with the topics that come up with group? Because a lot of times I will say women, um, and those are the most of the groups that we've done. We've done some with male survivors as well. But they're coming to us to group, not because they necessarily want to be there, but because they've been 
dealing with this for years and they're tired of how it's impacting their life. So sometimes they're almost resentful a bit coming because it's like, I'm tired of doing this work, I'm tired of the fact that I have to do this work and the abuser or abusers don't. Um, so they're, it's, it is hard work and so to put someone who's just been or recently traumatized in um, can feel like more work to that. So it's not afraid, we're not afraid of the emotions, it's more of wanting to be really respectful of what their, their um, needs are. And they may, not, they may not think that there are other options, it may be never occurred to them that there's advocacy or other type of support or maybe they're afraid of getting into counseling or something, so helping support them through that process if they're open to it. Maybe they just think group is the only option and they don't know what else is available. So thank you for asking that and clarifying that. Um, so the, um, the next one, those are with the intake or the screening. The next one is um, ones that come up in the group session. The ones that we'll be talking about specifically are that no one is sharing or else people are oversharing. It could be that group members clash or facilitators clash or group members dropping out. And then it could be also that the group just kind of goes off the rails from the agenda. Um, or also members panicking as it's ending or getting closer to ending. So those are specifically what we're going to cover today. And then if there are others, again, please feel free to put them in there and we will do our very best to, to at least touch on them a little bit. All right. So um, this, one thing I love about group is that in the 10 plus years I've been doing them and I've done a lot of groups, I can't think of any two that were alike. Every group has such a distinct personality that it just continues to amaze me. Um, but I, when I think about this question, I remember a group that was incredibly, incredibly quiet. And by week three, it's very unusual that no one is sharing, but it can happen. Um, silence is sometimes uncomfortable and it's really okay. That's the first thing is that um, if you're not comfortable with silence, learn to be. It's, it's a tool. It's a tool and it's a gift. And um, my rule for myself has always been I'm, I'm quiet until it feels slightly uncomfortable and then I'm quiet a couple minutes longer. Or not a couple minutes. That would be really long, but a bit longer. So first is, you know, are people sharing but there's just long silences? or people just not sharing. So if no one is sharing, if everything seems to be met with complete silence, one thing you can do is just try changing things up. So maybe um, try bringing in a hands-on project. Like you might take your break a little early, meet with your co-facilitator, do a little brainstorming. It's great if you have a couple things that are always sort of ready to go and then Maybe even a group project can sometimes be really helpful. So, um, you know, bringing in a collage to work on as a group or anything really. And then having some conversations while you're doing something else. Sometimes it's really helpful to people to not feel like the room is focused on them but focused on a thing you're doing. Um, the other thing is you can do it address the silence directly. You can, you know, the group seems pretty quiet today. I'm wondering if it's a topic or if there are other things going on. And you never want to do this in the first meeting because the first meeting there's going to be a lot of dead, dead space. It, there just is quiet. Um, but as, if we're talking about week three, that can be another thing. Um, what can we do as facilitators that could make this, make conversation more comfortable? Um, another thing you can try, some people prefer to write something down and share something they've written. So you, you, you could try art, but you could also try some journaling or writing. And then people have the option to share a little bit, even a sentence of what they've written if they choose to. And I guess I want to also go back to participation on whatever level it is, it's always going to be a choice in our groups. And so I have gone through group, groups where someone has said nothing the whole time and I thought, oh wow, this group, it just didn't, didn't work. But maybe after the very last group at the end, they'll come up to me and say, like this group changed my life. I mean, it, you never know what's going on with someone or how they're taking something in. And um, I've had that happen and then that person has wanted to repeat group because they felt like 
they were ready to participate, but they just couldn't do it the first time through. Um, you can have a bowl of topic pertinent questions to draw from and take turns answering. If you have handouts, you can have the participants take turns reading, but always give them an option to pass because some people may um, have difficulty with reading or English may be a second language or that may just be more terrifying to them than just sharing. Um, a couple of language things I've learned that really are helpful is saying who would like to share first rather than the opposite or the alternative, would anyone like to share? And who's next rather than anyone else? Um, which I think is, is more invitational. Okay. We've gotten some great questions. I think some of them we'll cover a little bit later on and what we don't, I'll try towards the end. Um, so thank you for adding. Well, let me think. One of them I will go to, the, because we just finished with the intake process, um, asking do we need to do a confidentiality form, have them sign a confidentiality form with the intake. And I think we, um, that's having the, uh, the impact, intake packet um, with the program have a confidentiality form. I think it's good to have one, like that's a chance to talk about confidentiality within your program and how you will do everything and the practice that you take and show them and um, explain your confidentiality practice. Um, every group member, and I think that's talked about in the, the first one as well of confidentiality because we can't control the, the participant's um, behavior, but we can make it very clear of what we, that we don't share. Um, Okay, so another challenge is someone oversharing and not respecting other people's boundaries. A big thing here, obviously, we have this first, don't wait to address it. This, is, um, this can really help. Here's a trick that we use with ours in that, um, of how the co-facilitators can work better together. So if you don't catch this on the, if you don't do an intake process or it wasn't caught before, is if I have my notepad or stack of papers and stuff, within it I might have just a yellow piece of paper or something. And if there is a situation, maybe someone is talking and perhaps it's just either going on and maybe I'm having that gut instinct of like, wow, or what they're sharing is um, not quite right, or maybe just a little bit either hugely off topic or I'm, there's just, you've got that sense that it's sort of going in a different direction. And it might just be me being overly sensitive about it. So the other facilitator, if they also kind of pull out their yellow card, as we call it, um, it's not putting it down on the table or making it obvious. It's just that communication of, yeah, I think I'm also feeling a little uncomfortable with this. We need to step in and say something. So one way you can do that is always going back to the guidelines. If you don't address it right away, it, I will tell you it gets harder and harder as the group goes on. And the group members are depending on you to uphold the guidelines and to maintain the safe space. So if you're, if you're and your co-facilitator are not addressing it, those who are not saying something might just, as Kay says, they'll vote with their feet. They won't come back to group if they don't feel like they have the space. So the guidelines, Hopefully you are doing these at the start of, you know, you've got ones done at the start of the group and then bringing them out each week is really helpful. If not, if you have started a group and you don't have those, I think it's a, you know, it's never too late to start because it's a living document and it's a way to reference back and it also is a nice way to, it's not calling out anyone, it's not shaming anyone, um, you know, rather than saying, uh, you know, Jane, you're just talking too much and no one else is having a chance to share. Um, I mean, that could totally shut someone down. And it's not kind. <laughs> and they're here because they want to share. So if I can say, you know, really validating, like, wow, it sounds like you've got um, a lot to share. I also want to go back to the guidelines that everyone agreed on at the start of just making sure that we give, um, you know, equal space for folks or that however it is, you know, however you've worded the guidelines as a group. And um, 
another, you know, it's, it's really recognizing that people are usually sharing because they care. Or um, they also may be sharing because they don't feel heard in other venues and situations. The gentle nudges and redirection, I love the way Kay says this. She goes, that's such a great point. Let me stop you right there and open it up to see, have others had that similar experience? So it, again, it, it doesn't shut them down, but it brings it back to the group so that they can um, you know, share that topic. The, if you really do need to direct, again, really the genuine validation, because I, I would don't want, there's so much shame around sexual violence, I don't want someone to come to a support group and experience any from us. So sometimes folks who, who may dominate the conversation or interrupt have a, have a history of not feeling heard or understood. So the validation could be, you know, it seems like you really want to help, but when we set the guidelines, we agreed to ask before offering advice. Would you be willing to, to check in with the other group member or, you know, I mean, to pause for a bit just to let, or to let someone um, speak from their own experience. There is a, um, another way you could say it is it seems like there's a lot that's important to talk about today since time is so limited here. Um, I don't want to cut you short on this and I also want to give everyone the, the space in the group. Um, there's, you know, are there services after or the advocacy or hotline and just what, services are available because we don't want to just shut, shut folks down. Journaling can also be a great one. Um, you know, the other services and counseling and um, again, the advocacy. There's a great example where there was a, a woman who was sharing, oversharing, <laughs> a lot of talking. They eventually, the facilitators switched to using a, just a soft ball and so the folks would Whoever was talking, you know, whoever had the ball could talk, and then they needed to pass it off to the next person, and that was helping to to stop the interrupting or limiting that. And someone was talking, and the the person who was consistently interrupting started to interrupt again. And facilitator said, "I'm going to have you hold off just for a bit because this other person still has the ball, is still talking." And when she did get the ball, she said, "I'm so sorry. I know I always do that. It just I feel like." I never heard or no one's listening. And that just switched to this magical moment within the group because the other group member said, I know, I feel like that way too. And so it gave enough um, both structure for the feelings but also safety so that everyone else wasn't just having to be silent while the one person shared. And they didn't need to use the ball after that because it, it, everyone felt heard and had the space to do that. So I think I can circle back to a couple questions and sort of combine them in this. One is um, a situation where you need to ask a group member to leave because of inappropriate behavior, how you do that. And the other one is once they you brought them into the closed group but it looks like it's not a good fit. So um, one of them could be you need to leave for just that meeting and one may be group isn't going to work. So I'll try to sort of talk a little bit about both of those with this situation as an example. Um, so group members clash and others are uncomfortable and distracted by it. I think one of the most important things here is don't wait to address it. And it's an easy thing to wait because um, it can feel like it will maybe pass or, you know, you don't, and because we don't want to address it because it's going to be, feels like it's going to be hard. And I can tell you, What's going to be really hard is if you wait. So um, again, if you don't address it, group members won't come back. Um, and it's usually not the two having the problem that aren't going to come back. It's the other people in the room because the last thing they need is to be in a room where it's tense or where they feel a lot more stress. Um, you can try identifying common ground or help group members agree to disagree if the disagreement is over a topic that has come up. Um, Say the topic is an issue around something faith-based or uh, a really strongly held belief of one uh, group member that the other one and she feels the other one may have attacked or whatever. There might be a way that you can work that out within the group, um, just having a, that conversation um, about different approaches and validating each person 
and doing the things that you're generally going to do as a facilitator. Um, and see if the guidelines address any of the behavior by either member two. That's a really good thing to circle back by. By now you understand that we think guidelines are really important. And I will tell you that the only time something has come up that was on the guidelines were the times I forgot to bring them into the room. So I had them, but I didn't bring them. And so um, I am pretty good about that now. You can, uh, most groups, we build in a break. And you can take the break a little early if it seems like just stopping and everybody getting a breath and a chance to um, get out of the room might be helpful. Um, I wouldn't do that at a point, um, I wouldn't do that just because everybody's upset because I think some people might not come back. So there may be a different way to handle that where um, you may need to ask two people to step out to talk to them in that sort of a case. But if you can catch it before then and you're starting to address it, maybe taking a break. Um, this is the one time that you might, or one of the times, where you may need um, to deal with this outside of the larger group. And you may even need to supervise your support. Um, if you're talking to the two people outside of the group, maybe their issue is something that exists outside of the group. Maybe one of them is um, dating the other one's old boyfriend. Or maybe they um, are roommates. Or maybe they live in the same, you know, it could be a lot of things. And maybe you can come to it understanding that that will be separate from group and sort of redefine the purpose. That might be helpful. Um, and you might offer that both of them, um, you offer them both the ability to put that aside and come back to group or to come back next week if that's better so that you're not saying you go home and you can stay. Um, you always want to make that as equal as you can even though one may seem more like um, is more troubling than the other unless it's you know, a hideous um, thing going on. You want to make sure that you're offering both the same thing. Um, when you're talking about when you go back, say they both go home that time, or say that um, there's been some really, some behavior that just tells you this person just can't be in group for whatever reason. Um, and so you meet with them and you have that meeting and, and do a lot of the things we've talked about earlier and ask them to leave. So I want to talk about how you talk about that when you go back into group. And it's really, really important that you don't talk about it a whole lot. Um, you never want to discuss group members or even group members who have left when they're not in the room. And, um, but you also don't want to leave people want, you know, wondering. So you can say, you know, Sally and Sue um, decided to take the rest of the group off today, but hopefully they'll both be back next week. Or they both have the option of coming back next week. If someone isn't a good fit, you can just say, um, you know, so-and-so won't be returning to group at this time. She may try group down the road. Something like that. But you don't want to share um, any confidential information or take sides or um, any of that. You, that, is, that said, you can deal with the feelings of the people in the group that might have felt scared or triggered or frustrated. Um, but you deal with that as their feeling and separate that as much as you can from the behavior that might have caused that. And I'll try to do a couple of the questions here. Um, when were there special instructions for an anger management group? Um, I have never uh, facilitated one of those, so I, I don't feel like I can speak to that. Um, we certainly do have in our curriculum one of the weeks is on anger, but it's not specifically anger management. It's more just recognizing and what our different ways folks are expressing anger. So I, I can't speak to that. Sorry about that. Um, and another question is how many guidelines are too many? And I would say that go with your group. I mean, I always have in my back pocket the ones that I know are really critical. We'll talk about those a little later. But if folks are engaged and saying, well, this would be important for me or this is important, that's, that's showing that they're involved in the group. So if, you know, if they want to have a bunch of them up there, I think what you'll also find is you know, when they start getting repeated, someone else might say, oh, yeah, that's already included in this one about respect or whatever. So that would be great if, they're, if they have a lot. And um, one question is um, about, let's see, if we have experience leading unstructured groups uh, with no curriculum or schedule. So 
we don't, they aren't groups, but we do offer the, um, they're basically healing through art. So drop in and we do that as a soft entry point. So perhaps people are afraid to sign up for a group or that's, that just feels too overwhelming. But maybe they, um, you know, once a month for two hours we have um, the sort of gentle structure of it could be a journaling workshop, it might be collaging, it could be um, traveling postcards is a program that, um, that we learned about and we're able to bring here. So that, that's the closest that we have as far as for the unstructured group. And again, it lets people find out about our organization and see if they feel safe here, if they have other questions that would make it more appealing for them to, or see if that group is something they want to consider. And let's see, so I'm going to move on. I'll come to the other questions after that here. So this one can be pretty quick. If the group kind of goes off the rails, I, I think about this sometimes. Sometimes people do it. The, the participants might do it because um, it's a tough topic or talking about this can be difficult and so they'd rather, you know, crack a bunch of jokes about it or completely distract because um, it's easier doing that than maybe talking about it. And one thing I would say with this is, is when, when people are coming to group, often survivors are, you know, surprises are not um, welcome. <laughs> so, Hopefully they have a list of what topics will be covered each week and oftentimes whether we know it or not, a group member might really be looking forward to a particular topic. If it, if it is on anger, if it is on self-esteem or body image, um, and they may be counting on that one. So if they show up and it goes completely off topic, they might leave thinking, oh, I really wanted to talk about this and I'm disappointed that they didn't. So if you do, if it does go completely off the rails and you're changing it to a new topic or the group is, um, really make sure to check in with the group. It is you know, their group and maybe everyone wants to move on from it and that's okay. But at least some of the original topic, I mean, allow for that there for those who are really planning on it. Honor the discussion that feels most urgent but offer choice to the group as a whole. And again, stick with the agenda and making room for the topic perhaps in a later week. Or if you're wrapping up the agenda topic and moving on you know, to a new one, um, you can also ask if, if this needs to come up again later on. It's just helpful for folks to know what to expect. Again, so there are not surprises there. And it might even be able to, you know, I've said this before, you know, I am totally good with the joking. I'm totally good with wherever this is going. I just want to make sure um, sometimes this is easier to do than talk about a difficult topic. And I want to give you all the space to talk about that if that's what you want. And I've had this too where folks have said, yeah, I know, I really was just kind of avoiding it. And just even naming that, not naming it from a particular person, but just acknowledging that it is difficult. These are, these are tough topics and um, this is hard and courageous work that they're doing. So, Um, we'll pick up a couple more questions really quickly. One is, one is about our experience in including all genders in sexual assault groups. And honestly, we have no experience with that. That's a great question and a really interesting idea and I'd love to hear more about it. I'd love to see a training on that, um, but we're not it. <laughs> but I, I will say there's um, the Safe Choice Domestic oh, right. Violence Program that we work right next door and very closely with. They have um, both female DV support groups and gender inclusive support groups. And so I can certainly connect you with Caroline Bartlett about that to, to give you information on that. I will say um, having done just a couple of groups for adult male survivors and it's been quite a few years, one of the challenges is that uh, we may have some that call in periodically but we've never, it's really difficult to have a critical mass to conduct a group. And, it, and also just kind of how it's talked about in the marketing, the, the groups that I was able to do with the male survivors um, often said, you know, like we wouldn't use the term victim or, I mean, it, I think there's just different terminology and different ways to, um, that they needed to discuss it. And part of it was they were, you know, there were some of the groups that were dealing with it on their sexuality. So this is, that's a rambling answer. I'm sorry about that. Um, we don't have the experience with it. I, I, 
I could see a lot of challenges with it. I think ultimately there may be some benefits, but I, I feel really protective of survivors and wanting to make sure that this feels like the safest group for them. And I, I don't think I could do that. I don't have enough um, training on that right now. And then the other question was on victim blaming, and I think Lori covered that pretty well. Um, again, it's about not making the participant wrong um, and maybe reframing it, but definitely addressing it so it doesn't stand, because if it stands, it can feel like you're complicit or like you believe that statement as well. So there are ways to do that. I would, one thing I would really encourage is with your co-facilitator or another person who's done groups or anyone really that you have a good working relationship with, role play this, practice it, have them throw some stuff at you. Um, because the more that you've practiced responding to that, the easier it will be when it happens. It won't catch you quite so off guard. And um, it will help you really, really hone where, you're, where you can really speak from genuinely. Um, so I find that that can be really helpful. So the next red flag is group members just drop out. So you have 10 people at the first group, and 8 people at the next group, and then 4. And you, where did they go? What happened? Um, and that is a big problem with groups sometimes. And so retention is something that um, I worked on a lot when I first started doing groups here because I, I thought that it was a really important um, issue and something that maybe we could have some impact on. So first of all, sometimes group members make healthy decisions that they're not ready for group. And you want to support that. I mean, I think that that's, it's really important. We're an empowerment-based, um, we do empowerment-based advocacy. And people making healthy decisions for themselves, you know, we get behind that. Again, reminding them, maybe group will be a good fit for you further down the road. And that, you know, whether you came to three groups, one group, whatever it was, you're always welcome to come and try it again. Um, but there are a few things that we found that really can help increase retention. And they're listed down below, and I'm going to go through each one separately. So encouraging notes to the next group is a really fun one, and one of my favorite things that we started doing many years ago. And the way it works is, at the end of group, on the very last day, everyone has an opportunity to write an encouraging note to the new group members coming up in the next group. And um, these are really short samples. A lot of them are much longer than this. They don't sign their names, and it's just written to the group. A lot of times it will say things like, you probably don't want to be here. I get that, but stay. It's worth it. Or I didn't want to be here. Or I felt like I'd never healed, but group really, whatever it is. Um, and then you take those notes, you type them up, um, on one page without signing the person's name again. And then at the beginning of the next group session, um, participants can take turns reading those out loud in the first group. And I can tell you that that voice coming from other survivors from the former groups will be way more powerful than anything I have to say about group. And it's really been a supportive and really um, a nice addition to groups, just having that voice. The second thing we do is weekly snail mail. So this is one point where um, we definitely would not do this for domestic violence groups. We never want to make anybody unsafe. And even with sexual assault survivors, when we do the intake, we will always ask if um, it's safe to receive mail. Do they want to receive mail? We tell them that the envelope will have the, YWC on the YWCA on the outside but if they prefer, we can send it in a plain envelope. So we talk about all that at intake, so we know ahead of time whether or not that's okay. If it's not okay but they want it, then I'll just hold the envelope and I'll hand it to them during group and say, this is your mail this week. Um, what we put in the mail, we sometimes we go to the stationery store and get really pretty paper and print quotes, words of encouragement, affirmations. Um, or we have a color printer, so sometimes we'll do it on plain paper with a color picture. I try to always make it look really pretty because people end up putting them up on their refrigerators, on their walls. Um, they really, really like these. And if you miss a week, you'll hear about it. Um, it'll be, where's my mail? Where did my mail go? 
And I always like to check the first week just to make sure I've got everybody's address right, um, so that one person is not getting mail but doesn't speak up. So I always say, hey, did everyone get their mail? Um, and this has just been a really, really important um, addition to groups for people. One thing, I sometimes I'll put a note that will say like, um, see you next week or something. If I do, it's on a post-it. So they can take that off and throw it away. And there's nothing on these. Uh, it's never on letter ahead. There's nothing that identifies this as coming from the YWCA or from a support group or anything. It just looks like something they could have printed up. <coughs> um, closing with a brag and why I'll be back. And so this is something we've also been doing for many years now. And it closes the group on a positive note, encourages people to return, and reminds them what they are doing has value. So um, the first group, I always add a little extra time because honestly it's really hard for people to come up with a brag. It's, it's hard for people to find positive things about themselves at first. And it's something that's great that we practice that every week. But I think also saying where I'll be back, and some examples of what people have said are, because this group is really good for me, or because I know I need it whether I want it or not, or um, because I want to see how Sally does with moving this week, or whatever it is. But it also, they make a commitment to the group, but they're also making a commitment to themselves. And so um, I think that that's been pretty integral in having people come back. And then finally is um, just thoughtful reaching out. So again, it would always be with permission, and maybe at the intake you're asking. So if you, the three groups go by, and by the fourth group we don't see you, do you want a reminder call? Would you like a check-in call? And if they're like, no, if I don't show up, don't bug me, we're not going to bug them. Um, but if they give permission, then you can do that. You never want to feel pressured. You never want them to feel shamed. Um, because they have enough guilt and shame to deal with. They don't need it around not coming to group if it didn't turn out to be a good fit. And the call can be not so much framed around why aren't you a group. Well, it should not be framed around why aren't you a group, but about what might be a better fit or what would be some additional support. So the call should be framed around the best support, almost um, whether that's group or not. And then again, really, really important, if they don't want to come back to group to say, that's okay. If you want to try this later on, no harm, no foul. We have groups going all the time, and we'd love to have you. Um, again, we work from an empowerment model, and so we want people to make the best decisions for themselves, and we believe that they're the experts, not us. And if someone is saying, you know, oftentimes it's very difficult for someone to say, no, this isn't quite right for me now, for whatever reason. I mean, you think about the sexual assault someone was not able, they did not have consent in that, and so to ask for what they need can be very difficult. So if someone, if I reach out and someone says, I just don't think it's the right time, I want to make sure to thank them and really applaud their taking care of themselves. I'm so glad they're doing that. It's not about, you know, I think they often feel like, well, I couldn't complete it. Here's one more thing I couldn't do. And I'm going to reframe that and say, I thank you for, you know, I'm really glad you're doing that. That makes me happy that you are, um, that you value yourself and you're taking care of yourself this way. And there was another, one question came through on the wait list. Uh, um, how do we do that? Is it first come, first serve? Uh, with the wheel, our practice is that if someone has been through a group, they absolutely can take another group. We just let them know. We have them, um, we give first priority to folks who haven't had the chance to do a group yet. We, um, you know, basically we will do it as first come, first serve. We keep the wait list and then once we get the, the group started, again, going through and calling people, there may be some that drop out either because, or, you know, decide it's really not the right time now or I'm not as ready as I thought or this doesn't fit with my schedule. So even, you know, we've had sometimes a long list, but those who actually can attend and are ready to commit to that um, is not more than we would put in a group. And the other thing is if you've got such a huge list, I mean, how great is that? And I, I would say, like, cool, do another group if you're able to do that. That would be wonderful to be able to meet that need. Uh, okay. So the last one here is you're doing, so the group is ending and members are feeling you're taking away their only support. This is 
really common and um, a couple of things we do on this. So planning a, a brainstorming or calendaring activity for the, the last session or the second to last one, Kay is great about this, printing up fun calendars and bringing stickers and colored pencils for the group members. And you can also bring a list of community activities that might appeal to them. So it's a way of staying connected. Group members might decide to attend events together or make coffee dates. You can do an activity that helps partic participants identify the support people they already have outside of group. If they, um, if they do want to connect outside of group, this is one thing that I, um, again, thinking about the safety, because you might have a very um, involved group member that says, hey, I'm going to pass around a paper and put your name on and we'll, I'll, you know, let's get together outside of group. I'm really aware of that and we'll reframe that because I don't want someone to feel obligated to put their name and number down. They may not want to continue. Or if it's a domestic violence group, that may not be safe for them to have contact. So in our SA groups, what I'll do is I'll say, oh, I really appreciate that you want to reach out and connect. I think that's powerful. What our practice has been, if someone wants to do that, they can bring their number and hand that out. Or you can have a, you know, a sign up sheet and leave it, you know, by the by the door and during the break if people want to or not. We always want to give folks the freedom to do that. And if it's handing it around the group, it may again people might feel obligated. The other thing that we do, this is starting from the beginning actually, is when we do the intros, it's like this is week one of eight. This is week two of eight. The first couple of weeks they haven't, you know, they're still gelling in the group, but it also is that reminder of this is, a, um, this is a finite process and it's a way of breaking, uh, it's kind of keeping it on the forefront so they're not suddenly surprised that, oh my gosh, this is the last week, what am I going to do now? But we specifically say that because we, we want to support and prepare them as best as we can for group ending. And other things that we do, you know, during that time, you know, sometimes they'll do, they want to do a potluck. Um, I think when people are having the panic around group ending, that is an, uh, another ideal time to really highlight that this is one more success they've, they've achieved, reminding them of how tough it might have been to come in at first and looking at how they're, now they're not wanting it to end and they've been so courageous in being caring and vulnerable with one another. Like that is not a small accomplishment. And, a lot of them could not have envisioned that they would have done that at the start. And now they're, that speaks to the fact that they've done that so successfully that they're concerned about it, it ending. So looking at what other supports there are in the, um, in the organization or in the community for them to continue being connected. And also, I always talk again about, you know, and there's our hotline. So if just because group is ending doesn't mean the support here is ending. You can still call and talking about what that looks like. And again, the advocacy and counseling. And, and are they able to repeat groups in the future? As I said, ours absolutely can. We just let them know that, um, that we give first, first priority to folks who haven't done it. But a lot of times we have the space for that. And they're pretty, it's pretty amazing when someone repeats group because they, they get different things out of it and they also bring a different perspective from it to it. So, all right, and the last red flag that we're going to cover is facilitator clash. And in a way, I think that this um, is one of the easier ones because you're dealing with someone, well, maybe it isn't easier, I might take that back. The main thing is don't wait to address it again because I think um, that that might even be more difficult for group members to be witness to or to be feeling that tension than with other group members because they're looking to you to lead and clearly you're not getting along. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, I think one of the things that's really important is that if you're working with a facilitator, chances are you have a really common goal here. And you both value survivor's healing and the survivor's well-being and the group, you know, the success of the support group is really, really important to both of you. So that's a really good thing to build on. And how you're going to get there is what's causing the grief. So 
Um, it could be that you split up the agenda so that if you have different styles, you can accommodate that. Um, it could be just a conversation um, can take care of it. But don't be afraid to bring in a supervisor or a third person to help you sort things out. Maybe um, you need help facilitating a really productive conversation. Changing facilitators should be a last resort because it is really unsettling to the group. They really um, get used to things. They're trying to build trust here. Um, they've maybe done the intake with you. And they came to group to commit, and they thought you came to group to commit. And so unless it's just there's no other way, I would really try hard um, to work, come from a pace of commitment and common ground and really try to find a way to make it work. Um, and then it's really important to realize also that we're models for disrespectful, <laughs> we're models <laughs> for different and respectful behavior. So it's okay to respectfully disagree. Um, it's okay to have different styles. Those are good things um, if you can play them out in group in a way that's genuine um, and you know that works out. I think that can really be a really good model for people who maybe don't know how to deal with gentle conflict. Okay. So the last one we have here, um, we've been talking about it a lot, but guidelines. This is just a. They really help frame the facilitation. So um, they, as I said here, they create guidelines and they're the safety net for everyone. So don't be afraid to revisit them. Um, again, the group members are looking to you, the facilitators, to keep this group safe on topic and meaningful. So some of the ones that you know, we always have in our back pocket of, you know, I'll always open it up to the group first if it's silent because again, this is usually going to be the first week of it. Um, I might say, what about confidentiality? Because I promise that I won't discuss anything out here. Is that important to you all? Or that you can speak about your own experience or feelings of group but not talk about what someone else said or who was here. So that gets them started. Um, we'll have things like speaking from your own experience. Or it might be, you know, you are each the expert of your own life. Respectful behavior could be one. And I think that's a good one to say if someone says, well, respectful behavior, great. Can you tell me just a little bit more about what that means to you? Because that can look very different for different people. So does it mean not interrupting? Does it mean um, showing up on time? I mean, that can help flush out some of those. Another big one is no touching without permission. Now, and I will. I put this one on here, and I'll say this has come up in other groups, and I, I'd like to put it on here if this works for you all, because generally, folks are you know caring people. So if someone is crying or upset, it might be my first inclination to comfort them, to pat them, to hug them, and I just recognize you know everyone's here because they had something happen to them they, that they did not. Someone did not respect their bodily boundaries, and I want to make sure that the the space we have here is respecting that. And it can give people a real freedom of knowing, oh, thank goodness, I don't have to, I can cry without someone needing to um, comfort me, especially for folks who do not want to be touched at all. Um, other things could be you know, cell phone usage, or uh, we'll have no violence um, or hate language. And that's a great one to have, you know, again, going back if it starts to get, for some reason, heated or um, whatever, you know, hopefully there wouldn't be any threats, but if there is in that of just saying, I, you know, I recognize there's a lot of emotion here. I want to go back to our guidelines and make sure we're still able to hold to those because those are critical for me as a facilitator. And again, you can have plenty more. You'll see with the, you know, the group might want to have a, add a bunch more. If they don't, if it's a really quiet group, just make sure you have the the ones in your back pocket of things that you think are really critical for this. There are different ways to do the, the guidelines also in that sometimes if we do it on a big post-it, people may want to sign it or initial it because they feel more invested in that. And then they're all saying, yep, I'm willing to, to do this. And 
that is both great. The thing to make sure you consider with that is confidentiality. Where are you storing that guideline? Um, don't leave the room and go into your office then and you've got the guidelines up there with everyone's name on it. So really being careful of you know, where this will be kept and or maybe they want to just do initials or a first initial or something or a picture on it. But, but that's a way for them to commit to, yeah, I am, I am recognizing this. So. Um, someone had a question about if there's a mandated reporter as a group member, do they? Yeah, that was, so um, that's a great question. So if a participant is a mandatory reporter, during our intake, we also go through and I'll say that I am a mandatory reporter. And I want to be clear with that so that no one feels surprised and I'll go through and talk about what that looks like. Um, if someone starts to share in group, I might, if it's going towards that, I would just also say, you know, if you're giving enough information here, this looks like, it, you know, you might be giving information that would be a mentor, and I want to be sure you have that, you know, you're kind of driving in this, in this process because what I don't want is to, someone shares in group and then I wouldn't then step out and report it because that's not empowering for them. They, you know, again, I want to give people as much control over their own process. So I explain it very carefully before they ever start group and also what our role is as advocates and um, so that they know. And I, I also feel like if someone is, um, that is a really good question as far as if they're, if a group member is a mandatory reporter, then do they need to report it? And by there, at that point, then they've disclosed that the person was receiving services. So I have not had that happen where someone within the group said they were a mandatory reporter. Um, but that's certainly something you could ask in the group and then talk about, you know, we, I, like I want above all to respect people's confidentiality. Um, so that was a really good question. Uh, another one came up of if gender specific groups are more successful or not on this one. So again, we don't have, um, with our program, we don't have experience of mixed groups for SA. And if you want to email Kay after, she can connect you with the program director of Safe Choice, the domestic violence program. They have had, they have a group that is gender inclusive and they can speak. Well, I don't know if they can see each other's comments, but Heather just put in some business. Oh, so uh, Northwest Network have all gender support groups for sexual assault survivors and FORGE, F-O-R-G-E, has a gender inclusive support group webinar too. Thank you very yeah, much thanks, for that. Heather. Yeah. And um, let me think here, there's another one. Oh, here, I was just going to move on to, we're doing the questions now. So I'll continue answering the ones that we have, but I also wanted to just do a little plug. If you are interested and able, on Friday the 18th, we will be in Vancouver, Washington, doing an all-day group facilitator training. I know this is a lot of information in a little bit of time. That day is a ton of fun. Kay and I are fabulous. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it's a lot more interactive work. Um, there's a lot of hands-on. Um, it's, it's basically condensing the two-day WixApp training that, was, that got us so fired up and started and, um, and hopefully give you some really strong skills. And, and really, I think a lot of people leave that and say, wow, I feel a lot more confident in addressing the scary situation. Um, one question was, um, let me think here. I, oh, I was thinking, going back on the piece about either screening folks in or out, one thing that I don't know that we clarified at the start, K or I, neither of us are therapists. And some groups have it where it might be co-facilitated with a therapist. I love that I can say, um, you know, if someone has a lot, maybe it has been a recent sexual assault or perhaps a um, suicide attempt, that's an easy out that I can say of, so I'm not trained as a therapist and I'm, I don't want to frame it as they're too difficult for the group, I want to frame it as I don't have the skill set to hold that. I mean, I want to make sure I'm, I'm really responsible with folks in the group and I want to make sure they get someone with the skills that they deserve, that they, you know, they deserve to have the best trained folks. And 
this is a psychoeducational support group, not a therapy group. And, and I want to um, you know, really honor that I don't want to step into therapy role. I don't want to pretend to be a therapist. Um, and that's a nice, nice way of just recognizing someone might have some, a lot of needs and we want to make sure they get the best support. Um, one question was about resources for men. I know there's one in six is certainly one and there are others. I'm not thinking of them off the top of my head now. We certainly do advocacy for, for male survivors. Like I said, it's, it's um, more challenging. Just, I mean, I look at the name of our organization, YWCA. That, um, we do a lot to, to clarify that we serve women and men, children and adults, that um, it's not just a, a women's organization. But I, I recognize that's a barrier right there. Another question was um, how, how to show people the real value of group. I think a lot of that, that might be from notes from previous groups. I know when someone calls in about group, I will say, would it help to hear a bit about it? Can I, would that be helpful so you know what to expect? And again, you can almost hear the sigh of relief. Yes, I, it's like, I, am I going to go in and have to tell my whole story? And I'll say, you know, and I'll say that, no, you don't. Actually, this isn't about rehashing what's happened. And sometimes people do, but it's more about getting skills and sharing some of the skills that they have. And I will also tell them that almost every time someone walks into that room first, that they realize that they're not alone and that, that they're not the only one that this happened to and, and that there is support out there. If possible, Whenever possible, we have folks come in to do the intake, both so that they can meet the co-facilitator beforehand, but also so we can just show them the room, show them what it's like when you come into the building. You'll sign in at the front desk, but you don't have to put your name down. And here's where the room's going to be. Because when you think about it, what if someone comes into the building and then do they have to go to the front desk and say, um, I'm here for the sexual assault support group? Or are they walking into a room and of people that look at them and then are they supposed to say, is this the sexual assault support group? I mean, you can imagine how terrifying that would be. So anything you can do to um, set a clear expectation and answer their questions and concerns is really helpful. And I think group is immensely valuable and I also know people have to be at the, the right time to do it. And so even when I plant a seed for it, I'll say it may not be now. Think about it. If it ever, if it ever is, you're always welcome to call or come back. Um, someone that is asking about grounding exercises. I'm going to actually I'm going to switch the slides so you can see our emails here. I'm going to try. Um, that's something we do a lot. We have a couple of really good ones, and if you want to email me, I can send those to you. Um, and then the link to the Circle of Hope manual. Maybe Donna can answer that one. And then someone asked, uh, I'm not sure, uh, what is the agenda for the group? I'm not quite sure what that, how to approach that one. There are sample agendas. Are there yes. sample agendas in the Circle of Hope? And I mean, there are a host of topics, and we just picked ones that I'm trying to think of them off the top of my head. Anger, trust, self-care, uh, relationships, um, myths. Boundaries. Bound, bound, <laughs> boundaries, yeah. Boundaries, a lot on that. Yeah. And you may find um, after doing groups, you know, we've kind of worked at some of them and thought, oh, this one is better earlier on, or this one, um, you know, the myth is a good one to do early on because people believe kind of what the, the misunderstandings about sexual assault. So that's a good chance to really clarify, a, you know, from our program and an individual perspective. I, I know these beliefs are out there and we don't hold a single one of them. And so it's a way of really reiterating um, that this is not a victim blaming space. And one thing we're really good about doing, um, because again, the more people know what to expect, the better it can be. So we always open a certain way with, um, you know, something that you did for self-care this week or how you're feeling. Or, there's always an opener. There's always time for closing with a brag and why we'll, why we'll be back. There's always a break at a certain time, which can shift slightly. But um, so it's predictable. So they know what to expect because that also increases the feeling of safety. 
and they know they're allowed to pass. You know, um, again, that they don't have to. It's not like everyone's going to go in a circle because if you've got someone who's really quiet, they may not want to each time. So really, the the predictability is is key. So I know we've been talking a ton, and there's just a couple minutes left. I was going to say I'm. I'm so grateful for the questions and comments, and I, I'm sure we didn't get to all of them, um, but I also want to leave a space if there are any more. And also, Donna, do you need to, should I do the wrap-up slide? Is that? Um, generally, I think everybody's asking for some of this information. I will um, send everyone out the link for the Circle of Hope. I'll also find out when the August um, 18th training will be posted, and I'll also send the follow-up, um, you know, in the follow-up PowerPoint and such, and the survey that we'd like for you to take after the webinar is over. And if you have any follow-up questions that pertain to this particular um, subject matter, please go and send it to uh, Lori and Kay. If you have technical or um, anything um, to do with this webinar that I might be of help for, go ahead and email me. And that's Donna at Wixap.org, W-C-S-A-P. But you'll be all be getting a follow-up email after this. So if you do have any questions, go ahead and post them up there. We have a couple minutes left. And we did have one I realized earlier that was um, doing this in rural areas. And uh, I'm trying to think where it was. Uh, remote. Um, oh. Uh, sorry. I wonder if it was like a Skype alternative or something. Oh, and that is a great, oh, great question. We haven't. I I can't speak to that. We haven't done it, and I fully recognize that there are a lot of barriers in the more rural areas to um, both safety and um, just where and being able to meet. So I won't, I won't go into that there, and partly because I, um, I'd almost want to support and connect you with getting with other rural programs because um, I know those are, um, what we have here is really hard to say, yeah, you just can't take this and put this into um, a different community. And um, yeah, there are others. Okay. I just want to thank Wixap and you all for sharing your time with us today. I really appreciate, appreciate you being here and appreciate um, the questions and the comments and, and the fact that you want to serve and support survivors in such a meaningful way. Yeah, I wish this was a two-way conversation because we'd love to hear some of the experiences and um, great ideas you all have. So hopefully we'll meet some of you on the 18th and we can um, learn, learn from you. And if you want a quick response, I would say send it to Kay first, since I'll be out for a bit, and she's super responsive on email. If there are questions, how'd you like that? I put it all on you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Just go ahead and don't forget to fill out the short evaluation. Let us know if others were on the webinar with you. You can email that to me at Donna at Wixap.org, W-C-S-A-P. I put that up in the chat area. And a recording of today's webinar materials will be posted on our website under trainings and then recorded webinars. Have a great day and thank you so much. This was great. Thank you, Lori and Kay. Thank you, Donna. Party. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.